Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to, or perhaps back to, the 2021 CGU online series of research presentations. We're happy you can join us today. The session is our general biogeosciences theme organized by the biogeosciences section of CGU. And this, um, this session will feature four talks that we're very much looking forward to. I just wanna make a few announcements before we get to the speakers and, uh, and share some information with you. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Colin Whitfield. I'm one of the conveners of today's session along with Colin McCarter from McMaster University and Maria Strack from the University of Waterloo. And before I get any further, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are participating today from traditional territories across Canada. Myself, I'm joining from Treaty 6 territory. This is the traditional territories of First Nations, including Cree, Dene, Nakoda, Soto, and Ojibwe, and the homeland of the Métis. And with this acknowledgement, I pay my respects to our ancestors of these lands and ask that each of us Let's take this moment to reaffirm our relationship with the land and with one another. So before we get to our speakers, I want to mention at the end of today's session, we're going to run a promotional video for the next CGU meeting. This will be the first in-person meeting in, in a few years, and it will be held here in Saskatoon. The theme of this meeting is science serving society. And so we very much look forward to welcoming as many of our members as we can uh, at that meeting next year. I also want to make a note that the biogeosciences section will be hosting their AGM today. That'll take place at 3 p.m., which will be about 10 minutes, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. That'll be about 10 minutes after we conclude our session with our speakers. And what we'll do is we'll first close this session and then we'll restart uh, the AGM, but using the same link that you use to join uh, the session you're in now. Uh, a couple of notes for, for those of you that are joining. Uh, there is a Q&A feature that you can use to post your questions. So uh, in most cases, if you have a short question, hopefully that'll suffice, but if it is a more perhaps complicated question that's not easy to chat or if it's just easy for you to uh, to ask your question verbally, let us know that and uh, and we can uh, allow you to to speak your question as well. And I just want to note as well one additional feature that we are including today is that there is a trans uh, a closed captioning option. So if you see the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, there's an option there you can, click show subtitle or hide subtitle, and that'll show uh, the closed captioning for, for, um, for the session and all of our speakers, if that's helpful for you. Okay, I think I have covered our notes to start us off. And with that, I am happy to turn the floor over to our first speaker. Sophie Wilkinson from McMaster University. So the floor is yours, Sophie. Look forward to your talk. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm going to presume you can all see my screen. Um, so thank you for joining today. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the session. Um, so yeah, as Colin said, my name is Sophie Wilkinson and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at McMaster University. And um, today I'm going to be talking about eco-hydrological trade-offs from multiple peatland disturbances, um, specifically, uh, discussing the interactive effects of drainage, harvesting, restoration and wildfire in a Southern Ontario bog. So I'd like to start by thanking my co-authors, um, Colin McCarter, Paul Moore and Mike Waddington, and also the funding bodies. So that's Borough Water Futures, um, the Global Science Initiative at McMaster University and the Wildland Fire MSERC Network. 
I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional lands that McMaster University is located on, and that is of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the land uh, protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. So like usual, I'm going to start with a brief intro um, and then cover the methods and research design before discussing results, um, some discussion and finish up with the implications of this work. And hopefully there'll be a couple of minutes left over for questions as well. So PLANs, we know, provide local to global scale ecosystem services from the provision of biodiversity um, to species habitat, to carbon sequestration and global climate regulation. However, they are being increasingly impacted by disturbance. Um, be this direct anthropogenic disturbance, such as drainage um, or harvesting, um, and also natural disturbance, such as wildfire. Uh, we now also have to consider indirect disturbances, such as pollution and climate-mediated drying. In some cases, restoration is mandated or re required. While research on the ecohydrological and biogeochemical effects of these disturbances is advancing, sometimes these disturbances interact and they produce impacts that are different to or greater than the sum of the individual disturbances themselves. And this can cause some challenges for us um, as these can be complex outcomes or um, novel outcomes. And it's these interactions amongst disturbances and the trade-offs resulting from them that are uh, currently rarely considered in um, peatland management assessments or policy. So here, this is exemplified by um, a recent wildfire in a drained peatland uh, in Quebec just last month, and also in the Waynefleet bog, which is the center of our study today. So here we took advantage um, of a drained, harvested, restored and wildfire impacted peatland to assess the interactions of these multiple disturbances, specifically relating to the impacts on uh, restoring the carbon sink function of uh, this peatland, which is of course a key aim of post-harvest restoration. Um, so to do this, we looked at three things specifically. The first thing being the effect of harvest depth on peat burn severity, and then the interactions of those along with restoration on the vulnerability to repeated burning and the potential for stagnant reestablishment. So as mentioned, the study area is the Wayfleet bog. It's a temperate bog in Southern Ontario in the Carolinian forest, which is that tiny, uh, light blue area down in the south of Ontario there with the peatland being located within this red circle and like most wetlands and peatlands in southern Ontario it is heavily disturbed it's been drained since uh, the early 20th century um, with two different areas being abandoned at different times uh, one in 1955 and one in 2000 before the whole area was re-wetted in um, 2000 by drain uh, ditch blocking. And so here's a map of the site and you can see the cutting blocks outlined in red there with the solid colors in the middle representing the area um, of study, which includes the 12 hectare fire that burned in 2012, which is represented by the brown color here. Um, it was a fire that burned for about eight days and was actively fought by fire crews. And then we also have an area of um, shallow harvest that was uh, left unburned, which is in the sort of yellowish color in the, um, the shallow harvest is in the green color, just slightly to the north and the deep harvested unburned area is um, the yellow color to the south. And so what I mean when I'm discussing these harvest depths, just to clarify, is that we have, there are two areas that were abandoned at different times. So the area that was abandoned in 1955 was only harvested for a few years. And then the area that was harvested until 2000 was harvested deeper down into the profile. So we're going to refer to those as shallow and deep harvest. Um, respectively. And for each of those sites, we also have 
uh, burned and unburned plots. Um, to note, in the shallow harvest area, it also includes varied topography, um, which we classed as field, edge and ditch, which you can um, conceptualize moving from, from the center of the, the peat field towards the drainage ditch. Uh, we took peat cores uh, to assess hydrophysical peat properties and carbon content um, from both of these areas and uh, field assistants also took over 2,000 depth of burn measurements back in 2013 um, to assess the peak burn severity. We have um, conducted over 10,000 modeling runs in Hydrus 1D um, to include the variability in the peak properties from each site and also um, the pre-restoration water tables uh, taken from Diamond et al. 2003. So, um, these were modeled over an extended drying period um, with scenarios being shallow and deep harvest, as mentioned, and pre and post restoration. So jumping straight into the results um, in terms of the difference in peat burn severity, uh, here we have depth of burn on the y axis um, in centimeters and the harvest depth on the x axis. So we can see that the deep harvest did have a lower depth of burn with the mean being 22 centimeters compared to 35 centimeters in the shallow harvest area. Um, but actually these depth of burns were not significantly different. And specifically when we look um, at both the field uh, topographic classes, so the deep harvest depth only has field, uh, whereas the shallow has um, all three. When we compare the fields, they are not significantly different. And it's actually the edge plots in the shallow harvest area that drive that higher depth of burn. However, we did find that the harvest depth um, affected the bulk density of the top 40 centimeters of the peat profile. So here we have bulk density um, along the X axis. And we can see that the um, deep harvested area um, plots further to the right in the higher bulk density, uh, with the deep being shown in maroon and the shallow being shown in the gray. Um, and this actually, this sort of uh, trend was maintained after burning, and we found that harvest depth had a greater impact on bulk density than burning did. So when we combine that with the depth of burn, um, we find that carbon loss per centimeter burned was, um, apart from the very top few centimeters, much higher in the deep harvest area than it was in the shallow harvest area. So directly comparing field uh, topographic classes again, you can see the deep harvest area plotting out to the right with the maroon squares and the shallow harvest area plotting furthest to the left um, with the gray squares and that's measuring carbon loss in kilograms of carbon per meter squared per centimeter burned. However, due to that higher um, depth of burn in the, in the shallow, we find that average carbon loss is similar between the two harvest depths at 15.1 and 16.5 kilograms of carbon per meter squared. So moving on to the results of the vulnerability to repeated burning. These are results from our modeling runs with exceedance probability here on the y-axis and gravimetric water content on the left um, on the x-axis. And we um, have here this dotted maroon line, which shows the 295% gravimetric water content, um, at which below this gravimetric water content, um, peat is vulnerable to smoldering. So we can see here these um, plots are for pre-restoration and in the deep harvested area on the left, only the zero to five centimeter increment is vulnerable to smoldering. Whereas in the shallow harvested area, um, this extends down to 15 centimeters. Um, and when we look at this for just the zero to five um, centimeter increment and we assess pre versus post restoration. We have here 
pre-restoration in a solid colour and um, post-restoration in a sort of hatched. So in the shallow uh, harvest, we found that there was 53% um, of model runs um, compared to 26% in the deep harvest where that gravimetric water content threshold was exceeded. Um, however, post-restoration, um, this reduced smoldering potential to about 17% uh, in both of the harvest depths. And so for sphagnum re-establishment, we assessed the um, tension in the top three nodes of the modeling domain, which equates to about the top one centimeter of the peak profile. And we looked at this relative to the um, tension threshold for sphagnum re-establishment, which is about 100 millibars of tension or 102 centimeters um, of water. And so here we did find really quite diverging results between the deep and shallow harvests. So again, we have the deep in maroon and the shallow in gray, and we also have the pre-restoration as a solid color. So firstly, looking at pre-restoration in the deep, um, the 102 centimeters um, of water tension is almost always exceeded um, in the modeling runs whereas this is compared to about 10% in the shallow harvest. And restoration, which we modeled by increasing the water level by 15 centimeters, um, which is the average for ditch blocking in harvested peatlands, um, does bring that exceedance probability down a little bit for um, the deep harvest, but it is still quite unsuitable for sphagnum reestablishment. Whereas in the shallow harvest, um, post-restoration, um, the peat is almost always suitable for sphagnum uh, re-establishment. So here we have found evidence of interacting effects of disturbances and the effects of within disturbance variability um, affecting the future outcomes of disturbance. So we found that harvest depth didn't significantly impact depth of burn. In fact, it was topography that caused um, the increased depth of burn and variability in the shallow harvest. Um, however, um, although depth of burn was slightly smaller than other drained peatlands, it was still quite comparable, reaching uh, above 40 centimeters in some regions. Um, and it's also interesting to note that even the, though the deeper uh, harvested area was closer to the water table, um, there was still uh, significant burning there. So we did find that harvest depth affected bulk density and therefore affected carbon loss per centimeter burned. Um, but when we accounted for the difference in depth of burn, this did not um, affect total carbon loss um, between the different harvest depths. And it's really important to note here that total carbon loss um, was similar to other drained peatlands uh, despite, despite prior rewetting of this site. So it was uh, rewetted in 2000 and there um, is evidence of uh, positive sphagnum regrowth in the area, although there was still um, extensive burning. And these are similar to other drained peatlands. However, because of the few studies on um, burned harvested peatlands, they're actually um, similar to drained horticultural sites, which also are afforested. Um, so then in addition to those effects on depth of burn and carbon loss, we also found um, that these interactive effects of harvest depth and restoration resulted in trade-offs in eco-hydrological conditions um, in the peat profiles and therefore in restoration trajectories. So we found that the shallow harvest area was more likely to reignite and is therefore vulnerable to the carbon losses associated with that. Um, 
but that restoration reduced smouldering potential at, at both, both harvest depths, um, which does support work by um, Granath uh, et al. 2016. Um, and so then we also saw that the deep harvest was um, significantly less suited to sphagnum reestablishment. Um, and that restoration increased the sphagnum reestablishment and potential, but um, the deep harvest area was still quite unsuitable. Um, and so it's, it's interesting that although wildfire actually further reduced uh, the ground elevation and therefore decreased the water table depth, active restoration is still required to return peatland function and to protect the carbon stock. And in the case of the deep harvested area, um, it actually still might not um, make that suitable for the re-establishment of uh, sphagnum mosses. And um, it's also um, important to consider here that these, these two uh, functions that we have looked at, these processes, are also not directly opposing or isolated, and that there might be other things that play in this peatland, such as the loss of key feedbacks due to uh, the peat depth being uh, shallower or thinner um, in terms of the high density of the peat profiles, meaning that there is little room for compression when the water table um, depth is increased. And so uh, the surface can't decrease to moderate that water table depth, which is likely to exacerbate um, smoldering vulnerability and high tension in the near surface. So overall, this really brings up questions surrounding policy decisions made at every stage of peatland use and management and their subsequent impact on the risk and severity of future disturbances, as well as the ability to recover. So the divergent eco-hydrological conditions we um, found resulting from the shallow and deep harvesting um, actually propagated through these other disturbances. And they have knock-on consequences for, um, for future disturbances and uh, reaching restoration goals. It does really highlight that wildfire needs to be at the forefront of decision-making um, regarding both harvesting uh, management and re-wetting and restoration um, goals and practices. Um, this is highlighted by the need for additional management in the deep harvest area if sphagnum um, propagation is the goal there. Um, it's uh, important to look at this in both a short and long-term carbon sequestration uh, perspective, whereby reducing the vulnerability to wildfire um, might help mitigate short-term losses, whereas the sphagnum mosses uh, may be required in the future to reaccumulate that carbon, but also then act as fire protection themselves. So um, the management uh, decisions that will be made will be sort of very much determined by the end goals uh, that people and sort of the, the industry decide on. So with that, I will leave it there. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sophie. Uh, perhaps if there's time for one quick question as we transition over to our next speaker. If there are any, you can pop, pop them in the Q&A. And Colin, perhaps I'll ask you to load your presentation as we're seeing if any questions come in. Oh, and if we don't have any questions, maybe I can ask Sophie a quick one. You bet. Were you, I, I think you, you started to explain a little bit there, Sophie, at the end, why you saw the differences uh, in the tension for the shallow and the deep, but were you surprised? I, I guess I would have thought that with that sort of higher bulk density that there'd be better moisture retention and maybe actually at least initially better, a better opportunity for sphagnum colonization. Yeah, that's a really good question. So it was surprising at least 
the, the sort of scale of the differences um, between the results there. And you're right in that at first, and I think that's why the, um, the vulnerability to fire was more similar because the um, deep harvested area with the higher bulk density did have a greater proportion of smaller pores and it had um, a higher moisture retention. But then um, as soon as you sort of got past that, um, that certain level of drying, um, the tension just increased so rapidly um, because the water was being held in those in those very small pores and because there's there was really no um, sort of gradient in the pore size distribution because we were already down so far in the peat profile um, and the peat was so dense at the surface that you did get that sort of like runaway increase in, in tension um, with the extended drying period. Thanks. And I guess we should move on now. Yeah, thanks for your question, Maria. And thank you again, Sophie, for your, your talk. Uh, our next speaker in the session is Colin McCarter, also joining us from McMaster University. So the floor is yours, Colin. Thanks. Um, so thank you for having me and listening to me talk for the next little while. Um, I'm really excited to, to tell everyone about some kind of exploratory research that uh, my co-authors, Paul Moore and Mike Waddington, and myself uh, have been doing, trying to restore a different type of peatland that's been disturbed, ones that are contaminated by industrial contaminants, uh, in this case, metals, um, and using different, a different restoration technique, the acritelm transplant. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that uh, the sites that we've used in this research uh, and data are on the, uh, the lands of the, uh, the Atacameshing, the Ishnabek, and the Wanapate First Nations, and that we also acknowledge the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. I also want to thank them for their stewardship of the land and water over all these years. Now for centuries, humans have been emitting uh, pollutants into the atmosphere since pretty much the industrial revolution and the advent of smelting. And smelting is actually rel a relatively common process uh, where uh, contaminants such as nickel and copper metals or heavy metals as you might know them, as well as other contaminants like sulfur are released in the atmosphere. And these contaminants are moved uh, in the atmosphere by prevailing winds and eventually they begin to be deposited back on the landscape. And in this case, um, in areas where we have a, a prevalence of peatlands, the contaminants don't move off into the aquatic systems, they actually stay within the peatlands. And Sudbury in Northern Ontario is a very uh, good example of this, where we have smelters releasing copper and nickel, uh, and a lot of peatlands that have actually retained those contaminants. And if you actually look at distance from the smelters in Sudbury and looking at peatlands all around the, the smelters, what you can see is that there's kind of an exponential decline in nickel and copper concentration in the peat as you go further and further away from the smelters. And so this is kind of the remnant peat or the current peat concentrations of these nickel, of these, um, these contaminants. And so when these contaminants enter the peatlands, they begin to change the peatland and decrease functionality. They take these green, vibrant peatlands and make them brown, make them gray and dead. The sphagnum moss is lost, ericaceous shrubs die, and many of the peatland species that are critical for peatland function uh, die out because of the elevated uh, metal concentrations. And so typical restoration techniques, uh, such as those that we use for uh, harvested peatlands, uh, don't work because we have peat with a toxic amount of metals to sphagnum mosses and other plants. And so we need a different approach to be able to restore these peatlands uh, and ensure their long-term survival and allow the functionality to return. And so an acrotome transplant might actually be the best approach. And it is exactly what you're thinking. We drive onto a peatland with our big machines, we take the top 20, 30, 40 centimeters of moss, and we simply pick it up and drive it off. And we bring that to our other site. Then you might be thinking, wait, 
we're also going to be disturbing another peatland. So it doesn't make sense to disturb a peatland, to restore a peatland. And in this case, as long as we don't harvest too deep, the acrotelm is able, these peatlands are able to bounce back and uh, within a couple years to decade. Meaning that we have, can have a relatively low impact restoration. Now, when we get to our contaminated site with our elevated metals, and hopefully we've restored and kind of removed those contaminated sources, um, like Sudbury around Sudbury has done and done a very good job regreening the uplands. We simply plop that acrotelm, that upper 20, 30, 40 centimeters of, of moss and peatland on top of that contaminated peatland. Now, there's a lot of things going on here that are going to affect the success of restoration, essentially the, the return of functionality. And that's how much metal is within the, the peat itself, the thickness of this transplant, uh, as well as the the mosses themselves, they have specific hydrophysical and geochemical properties that are going to change how metals and water is moved within these systems. So to do some sort of full factorial design in the field, it's going to get really, really expensive really, really quickly. And you'd probably run out of peatlands before you can do a real full factorial design. So we decided to model this and model it in a way where we can take advantage of all the literature uh, in peat hydrophysic properties, uh, as well as geochemistry and what we know about peatlands around Sudbury to come up with at least some idea of whether or not this idea is feasible. So the model themselves are physically based and they're coupled hydrological and geochemical models uh, in Hydrus 1B. And we have our remnant peat here uh, in this kind of brown color and it, we have our nickel and copper concentrations. We related that to the distance from the smelter. And we did this in five kilometer bins, so at five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 20, and so on. On top of this remnant peat, we simply plopped on a transplanted acrotone. And this we varied in thickness from five to 30 centimeters in five centimeter bins. And we also looked at different species of sphagnum mosses and their associated hydraulic parameters, sphagnum fuscum, rubellum, and magellanicum, as well as an average sphagnum uh, taken from a bulk meta study done by Lou and Lennartz. Now we can simplify these sphagnum species to be a bit more general and think of them as hummock species or those that grow furthest from the water table, hollow species that grow in between hummocks, and lawn species that grow closest to the water table, typically around pools or uh, large expansive areas. And then again, our average sphagnum. Now being a coupled model, hydrological and, bio and geochemical processes, we have a lot of parameters that we need to, parameter to put into the model. And so we certainly haven't measured all these parameters. That's several years worth of work to do at minimum. And so we went to the literature. And we had to make some very key simplifications to what we know about the water flow and solute transport within uh, sphagnum and pea. The first is in our soil hydraulic properties. We're using the Van Nicken Wallen model, which is a single porosity model, uh, which we know that peat isn't really considered single porosity, but we have to simplify that partly because our solute transport models um, have to be convection, have to be the convection dispersion model, because we didn't have enough uh, information about uh, dual permeability models to parameterize these in a way that was physically realistic. So we have a bit of simplification on how water and solutes are flowing. And we also have to uh, simplify the absorption of our different, of, of nickel and copper. Uh, in the remnant peat, we have a linear isotherm. Uh, and this was taken from field measurements in the, around the Sudbury region, as well as in the uh, sphagnum itself, we're using the Freundlich isotherm. And this is because our, our concentrations in the pore waters never really reach a point that we uh, can observe any sort of limit on uh, absorption. And so we don't need the uh, Langmuir isotherm or any more complicated isotherm. And so that makes up the bulk of, of how water and chemicals are gonna move. Um, but there's also that the critical part of success. How are we gonna define success of these transplants? And so to do that, we have the soil water pressure threshold. So this is uh, just like in Sophie's talk, set to 102 centimeters uh, pressure or 100 millibar. 
And so anywhere below that threshold, we are considering that the sphagnum will be under hydrological stress. This is when the, the uh, hyaline cells or water storage cells in the, in the capitula and the sphagnum drain, and we do, and there is a decrease in photosynthesis at this time, um, as well as the metal concentrations. And so essentially a toxicity to both nickel and copper in the sphagnum itself. And here, this is approximated by a decrease in chlorophyll concentration. And this was measured for both nickel and copper around 10 to the negative six millimole per milliliter um, in, the, in the pore waters. And so the success is gonna depend on the interaction of all of these different um, the hydrological and geochemical processes with both the hydrological and geochemical um, thresholds. To drive the model, we have a precipitation measured from the Sudbury region um, over a, one of our study years. And within that precipitation, we have a constant concentration of copper and nickel, which is equivalent to the average annual de wet deposition in the area. We also drive the, drove the, the upper boundary with potential evapotranspiration and set the lower boundary um, equal to the water table measured in a disturbed uh, peatland uh, due to contaminated metals within the Sudbury region. So getting into results, so we're going to start with soil water pressure and then move into the contaminants and then into couple, coupling these two, um, uh, the, the, the two uh, potential stressors. And we have, we're going to see a few of these graphs and it's pore water pressure here um, and anywhere below 100 is our, is our kind of threshold of stress or measure of stress. So we want everything to be above 100. And you can see different transplant thicknesses going from five centimeter transplant thickness to 30 centimeter transplant thickness, uh, going from black to kind of uh, very bright red. And then we have our study period here. And this is our hummock. So our kind of our one that typically grows furthest from the water table. And when we draw our, our threshold line, you can really see very clearly that the hummocks do really well. And even with a five centimeter, um, transplant thickness, the black line here, you're only dipping below 100 centimeters a little bit during the year, which is perfectly fine for sphagnum mosses. And our hollows, hollow species do the same thing, fairly similar, which is good to see. It's when we look at the lawn species, these ones that typically grow close to the water table, do we see really big differences and really long, prolonged periods that the soil water pressures are below 100 centimeters. Uh, indicating that there's kind of more stress in the law of the lawn species. And when we look at kind of our bulk average, it kind of shows a, a much uh, a much worse scenario if you just took an average sphagnum, which is an unrealistic, but a good comparison nonetheless. In short, though, you kind of need 20 centimeters of transplant just to mit mitigate the hydrophysical or hydrological stressors. But given that the hummock and hollow both perform really well, um, we're going to focus on the hummocks going forward for the contaminants of nickel and copper, uh, or we'd be here for several hours just going through all the results. So looking at nickel surface concentration, so this is the concentration in the second node of the model, so about uh, three millimeters below the top of the, the surface. Um, and again, we have our, our time over our, our I'm sorry, our uh, study period, as well as uh, we're looking at log 10 of nickel concentration. So this is 10 to the negative six, our threshold, and the same color scale for our different transplant thicknesses, five and black, all the way up to bright red at 30 centimeters. And this graph particularly is five kilometers from the smelter. And when we add in our 10 to the negative six threshold, you can see that there are clear prolonged periods that the sphagnum moss, the, the capitula, the growing part of the moss, is going to be having elevated concentrations of nickel, um, particularly through kind of this bulk part of the summer. But it does respond to the precipitation events quite strongly. So they decrease quite rapidly throughout the year or throughout precipitation events. And when you move to 20 kilometers from the smelter, we really find that the, the pattern remains the same, but the concentrations just kind of decrease because the base peat concentration is that much lower. And so for nickel, it seems that 20 centimeter, a 20 centimeter um, transplant is looking like the minimum. 
uh, particularly close to the smelter. When we look at copper, we see very similar patterns in the different uh, transplant depths, um, where kind of 25 and 30 centimeter transplant depths uh, certainly perform the best. And when you get out to 20 centimeters away from, or 20 kilometers away from the smelters, really any transplant will, will, will be relatively successful when it comes to copper concentrations. Um, and so despite that there's higher remnant copper concentrations in the peat, the vertical transport was actually greater with nickel, um, suggesting maybe to focus on nickel going forward um, due to the, the, its, more, its higher mobility within the peat itself. And so we can kind of, we can actually, those were just some snapshots, but we can actually look at all of the model runs that we've done. And you can see each one of these squares is essentially a model run where we have distance from smelter here and transplant thickness along the, the Y axis. And the color scale here is our log 10 concentration again. And the red line is the 10 to the negative six or our threshold concentration. This is for copper. And this is, we're looking at the, the 25 percentile exceedance probability here. Um, essentially, a very, we're, we have a very conservative um, estimate of when conditions of copper or nickel, as you'll see in a, a minute, will negatively impact um, sphagnum function. So the lighter colors here, the yellows, mean that the, the top of the sphagnum, where sphagnum is growing and the top of the transplant, uh, is being negatively impacted by copper. And as you get more and more blue, uh, you don't have those kind of negative impacts. And it's pretty clear that you need above 15 centimeters transplant for copper. And when we look at nickel, um, we see that that kind of does increase. And so to play it safe, you know, a 20 centimeter acrotelm transplant thickness for both nickel and copper would really be ideal. Now, so far we've looked at everything in uh, relative isolation. And so the, when we combine the results of our hydrophysical or our, our soil water pressure uh, threshold with our chemical thresholds, this is what we're showing in these graphs. So again, transplant thickness and distance from smel smelter, but instead of showing a concentration, they're representing the increase in time over the simulated season that the soil water pressure threshold, the negative 100 millibars, has been exceeded when either or the nickel or copper uh, thresholds were not exceeded. So additional periods of stress that the transplant would be experiencing throughout the year. Essentially, do we have any additional hydrological stressors above and beyond the chemical stressors um, on our different microforms? Essentially trying to answer, does microform matter in this case? And when we look at hummocks, it's 0%, it's all white here. And as we go up in our, our, our uh, graph here, or our, sorry, our legend, the hollows really only experience that in the kind of the larger transplants, indicating that a hummock hollow topography for the acrotelm uh, transplant would be ideal. The higher hummocks from the water table, you can, and then the lower hollows, and you'd be able to take large areas to be able to transplant without worrying about uh, air patches dying off due to some of these interacting effects. And really, we want to avoid lawns. Lawns are not really suitable for this technique. So targeting hummock and hollow topography avoids the compounding negative chemical and hydrological impacts. And so with the deeper the the deeper acrotelm transplant, the more likely restoration will succeed, um, but less likely that the donor site will effectively recover. And so, targeting a hummock hollow microform and topography is really idea to uh, avoid the co-stressors of water and metals. But we do need further modeling to look at kind of successive multiple years of of accumulation in the mosses as well as hone some of the geochemical properties of sphagnum, particularly around adsorption and desorption for most metals going forward. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone that had been involved, has been involved in this project, uh, the Alcare project, as well as invite questions if I have any time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Colin. Really interesting presentation. Uh, uh, I suspect there are questions, but I think we should move on to keep to schedule. Maybe this is an opportunity to, I know Colin will be at the AGM, or I expect Colin to be at the AGM. He's nodding. Come to the AGM. You can ask him a question there. Uh, 
So uh, that's one option. And uh, his email address was there in the slides as well. So feel free to reach out to him. Thanks a lot, Colin. Uh, our third speaker today, Jacqueline Hung from Queen's University. The floor is yours. Great, thanks for the introduction, Colin. And um, I'm really happy to be part of this session today. Um, and also really want to acknowledge that we're grateful to be able to conduct our research on traditional Inuit territory. Um, today, I'll be presenting some results looking at the impact of soil nitrogen availability on greenhouse gas balance and the trace gas fluxes in a high Arctic wetland. And this was conducted in conjunction with my um, my uh, supervisors, Neil Scott and Paul Trates, also at Queen's University. Um, so we understand that the, Ar uh, the Arctic regions are warming at a faster rate than that of the global average. So from 1971 to 2019, the annually averaged Arctic near surface air temperatures increased by 3.1%, which is three times faster than the global average. And in that same period, the total annual precipitation has increased by more than 90%, with the majority of this being uh, an increase in rainfall. Um, and since that period of time, Arctic permafrost itself has also warmed by two to three degrees since the 1970s. So with all this combination of uh, changing weather patterns, uh, climate warming in the Arctic, um, we're seeing changes to abiotic factors that influence biogeochemical cycling in complex ways. And when we couple this with permafrost thaw um, and the warming temperatures, we're seeing large stores of carbon that are threatened to be released in these high latitude regions, which can further contribute to these altered cycles. And warming in the high latitudes um, and generally is expected to accelerate the decomposition of soil organic matter, potentially altering, altering rates of nutrient cycling. And temperature increases can also alter the above ground plant composition, which then potentially alters available nutrient pools through nitrogen fixation. And changes to nutrient availability have the capacity to stimulate environmental change by either promoting um, or reducing carbon uptake and release. And most of our knowledge thus far has come from fertilization or nutrient addition studies, but hasn't really been studied in its natural state in the environment. And in the high latitudes, wetlands play an important role in the carbon dynamics um, as they sequester and store large amounts of carbon and have long been regarded as carbon dioxide sinks due to the dominance of gross productivity over respiration. But as warming temperatures are expected to increase respiration in the Arctic, this could lead to a shift in the CO2 balance, depending on the response of gross primary productivity, which could contribute to a decreased net carbon storage and potentially, potentially shift Arctic regions into net carbon sources. And Arctic wetlands are also unique for their waterlogged anoxic environment and rich vegetation cover, um, which, is, um, which is rare in the uh, high latitude regions. But this can also promote um, trace gas production of powerful greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide. And vascular plant species that are abundant in these wetland environments can be conduits for methane release. And so we generally think of wetlands as methane sources. So to understand the future trajectory of the greenhouse gas balance of these environments, we need to understand the environmental controls behind the nutrient cycling that mediates a lot of their production and uptake. So to do this, we examined um, the dynamics of plant available nitrogen within a high Arctic wetland. Um, and these occurred um, across variable moisture regimes. And then we also looked at the influence of different moisture regimes on trace gas fluxes. So namely carbon dioxide release, the net methane flux and the net nitrous oxide flux across two growing seasons in a Canadian high Arctic wetland. We did this work out of the Cape Bounty Arctic Watershed Observatory um, in the Western Canadian high Arctic shown in the inset map in panel A. Um, the region itself a, is characterized by continuous permafrost um, with a half meter to meter active layer during the growing season, which typically extends from June to August. 
And then within the wet set, uh, within, within the watershed, we conducted our sampling in that green square there in the wet sedge meadow. And wetlands within the Cape Bounty Arctic watershed um, cover approximately 17% of the aerial surface. Um, the plot itself shown in panel B is approximately 4,000 square meters in size and it's fed by a perennial snowpack directly north of the meadow. And we chose to focus on this land cover for several reasons, but namely because it is the most productive ecosystem in this environment and will likely respond drastically to changes in um, climate and uh, in climate in the high Arctic. The vegetation itself, you can see in panel C, um, it's diverse relative to the rest of the environment. So it's pretty much a 100% layer of grasses and sedges with an underlying sphagnum moss layer. And then in some of the wetter areas of the wetland, we have um, nostoc cyanobacteria present. So as I previously mentioned, um, there are varying degrees of moisture availability within this wetland. Um, and you can kind of see that separated out in panel B. Um, and that was that allowed us um, to uh, investigate nutrient availability and trace gas release across naturally occurring moisture gradients. And these moisture gradients are kind of separated by hummocks that were created from historic cryogenic events. In the wet tracks, um, we typically found volumetric water content, the soil moisture to be at um, more higher than 85%. Um, and in the drier tracks, um, they tended to be at around 65%. Um, so to assess for soil nitrogen availability, we used um, ion exchange resin membranes, which are pre-charged polymers that mimic plant roots by adsorbing nutrients to their surface. And we did uh, three deployments across the season, so early, mid, and late season resin deployments to assess for the temporal variation of nitrogen, nitrogen availability. To um, assess for trace gases, we sampled them across a 45-minute period in the dark chambers showing in, shown in panel C and analyzed them using gas chromatography. And then temperature and moisture were taken in um, around the sampling sites and averaged as well. And then we analyzed for group differences across time and between moisture gradients for the variables we mentioned uh, that we measured. To give you a little bit of the context in terms of the climate in those two years, um, our work was conducted in the growing seasons of 2017 and 2018. Um, and we found that uh, mean growing season air temperatures were similar across both years, which were and at 1.88 and 1.83 degrees centigrade, and those were typically cooler than normal. Um, but we found that 2018 had nearly doubled the amount of rainfall of 2017. And this climate information also allowed us to assess for the role of climate on interannual variability of um, the variables that we were interested in. So when we looked at uh, the seasonal patterns of available nitrogen, we found that ammonium availability was always greater in the wet tracks um, in both years. And when we contrasted the moisture tracks, um, the wet tracks had 1.3 times the amount of ammonium that, um, that the dry tracks had, and these differences were statistically significant. Um, across years, the differences in ammonium availability were also significant um, between years and across the growing season, so from early to mid to late season. Um, and seasonally, in both years, we found ammonium availability to be greatest in the early season after thaw with small decreases in the mid and late season in 2017 on the left and moderate decreases in the mid and late season in 2017 on the right hand side. Unlike um, ammonium availability, we found nitrate availability to be greater in the dry tracks in both years. And there were also differing seasonal dynamics for nitrate availability between 2017 and 18. So in 2017, in the, on the left-hand side, we found nitrate to be highest in the late summer, um, but they were um, continuously high in the early and mid season in 2018 before decreasing in the later season on the right. Uh, in 2018. Um, so we also assessed 
as I mentioned, for CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide release across the two seasons. And we found um, carbon dioxide release to be similar across wet and dry conditions. Um, but in 2018, the wetter year, uh, carbon dioxide release was elevated in the wet tracks. Um, in both years, uh, methane release was greater in the wet tracks than the dry tracks, and this was particularly pronounced in the wetter year as well, where methane release in wet tracks were nearly four times greater than that in the dry tracks. And um, nitrous oxide release, which is in the right hand side of each panel, was greater in the dry tracks in both years, um, with overall the higher rates in the drier year of 2017. Um, and the wet sedge meadow shifted from being a nitrous oxide source for most of the green growing season to being a late season sink. When we put all our variables together, we conducted a principal components analysis to examine groupings and correlations amongst the variables. And this allowed us to show clusters with similarities and where vectors that were closely, more closely related to each other and also the magnitudes of different vectors and variables for each principal component. And when we see, um, we can take a look at the wet and dry plots showing a clear separation on the loading plot on the left. Um, and overall, we found temperature, moisture, ammonium, availability, carbon dioxide release, and methane release to be most strongly correlated together along the first principal component when both wet and dry tracks were considered named. So this PC uh, principal component, namely, corresponded to ecosystem productivity. Um, and the variables that fell along that, that are inf influenced by the nitrification pathway, so these are nitrate availability and nitrous oxide production, those fell along the second principal components. Um, so when we consider these together, the results tell us that under warmer, wetter conditions, which is what the projections are telling us about um, the future climate in the Arctic. We can expect to see higher ammonium availability that corresponds with greater carbon dioxide and methane release. But under drier conditions, our researchers, our research is suggesting that the dr drying out of high latitude wetland soils could promote higher nitrate availability, which then would lead to more nitrous oxide production and the subsequent release. So ultimately, the results from this point to the importance of moisture um, over temperature in influencing nitrous, uh, nitrogen availability and the subsequent greenhouse gas release in this wetland. We took it this a step further and compared the relative contributions of the three greenhouse gases to the overall greenhouse gas balance of the wetland. Um, so we calculated carbon dioxide equivalents from the flux values uh, indicated there in the brackets on the left column using those global warming potentials from the fifth IPCC assessment. And um, we use the methane and nitrous oxide fluxes from this study and then the net ecosystem exchange CO2 values from an accompanying study in the same wetland. And we found that in 2017 and 2018, the wet sedge meadow was a net sink for carbon dioxide and on a carbon dioxide or a CO2 equivalent basis, the net ecosystem exchange offset fluxes, fluxes of both methane and nitrous oxide in both study years, um, despite the significantly higher global warming potentials of methane and nitrous oxide. In the drier year of 2017, nitrous oxide release was greater than methane on a CO2 equivalent basis. And this relationship was reversed in the wetter year of 2018, um, again, demonstrating the importance of environmental conditions on the interannual variability of trace gas release. A lot of um, high latitude wetland environments point to methane emissions as being a key greenhouse gas um, in the overall carbon balance of northern permafrost regions. But um, this exercise shows us that it's important to consider the contributions of other greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides, even in waterlogged environments where anaerobic processes are expected to dominate. And with these findings on the importance of carbon dioxide in the net greenhouse gas balance, we anticipate that high latitude wetland environments like wet sedge meadows will continue, 
will contribute to negative feedback on the climate system, particularly under warmer weather conditions, such as those forecasted for the future Arctic. So in summary, we found um, significant differences between moisture regimes um, for temperature, moisture, and nitrogen availability. In the wet plots, nitrogen um, availability was, or ammonium availability was higher, um, and that correlated with higher um, carbon dioxide and methane release. Whereas in the dry plots, we found um, higher nitrate um, availability, and that correlated with nitrous oxide release. Um, overall, the wet tracks um, had, and the wetter season of 2018 favored more carbon dioxide and methane release, while nitrous oxide release was more dominant in the drier um, year under more aerobic conditions as well. And ultimately, despite the higher global warming potentials of methane and nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide was still the dominant greenhouse gas in this wetland on a CO2 equivalent basis, and the wetland was a net sink um, when considering the net greenhouse gas balance. And we find that the results from the study show the importance of seemingly small differences in interannual environmental conditions, um, particularly in soil moisture, having a large influence on the Arctic's wetland greenhouse gas source or sink potential. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our funding sources and I'd be happy to take any questions if we have time. Thanks, Jacqueline. Nice presentation. And we certainly have time for questions. So those of you that have questions, I'll ask you to uh, pop them in the Q&A box or perhaps raise your hand and we can un help you to be unmuted to ask the question to Jacqueline. I, I, I'll ask a question, Jacqueline, while we're waiting for others to come in. I was just looking at some of your pictures and um, thinking about the landscape that is visible in the pictures uh, behind you and towards yeah. the end of your of your presentation. The the meadow that you worked in, how typical is that? Like, what would be kind of you know, thinking about that in the context of the landscape of the Arctic? Are these meadows kind of common and widespread and occupy a significant part of the landscape? or uh, what would be, question. What would yeah. be the so, context there? So within the, um, the water, I, I mentioned within the watershed that we work out of, it's 17% of the aerial coverage and it's typical um, of other high, typical more high Arctic environments, um, like when we move up towards um, Ellesmere Island and and um, also on Baffin Island, where we tend to see the wet, these types of wet sedge meadows as being um, the wetland um, that's most dominant. And then um, we aren't really seeing, we don't, we're above the tree line, so we don't see any effects of a lot of the shrubification that's occurring in lower subarctic or lower Arctic regions. So it's fairly, um, from my understanding and from, seeing um, other studies done um, on our, uh, high, high latitude wetlands. These are pretty typical of the um, environments that we are finding up there. Right on, thank you. Maybe time for one more quick question if anyone has one. All right, thanks so much, Jacqueline, for your presentation. And we will move to our fourth speaker of the afternoon. Tianxi Wang from the University of Waterloo. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tianxi Wang from uh, Department of Geography and Environmental Management in University of Waterloo. Uh, today's topic 
uh, for my presentation is the impact of soil sod and moisture on Juncus bauticus in constructed firm Alberta. Uh, my study site is called Nicotinoti Fern, um, which is uh, in Alberta oil sand region, uh, Fort McMurray, which is designed as a self-sustaining and carbon accumulating peatland system. Uh, the major plant communities adhere are Junkers, Caribs, and Taifa. Uh, and my interest is to find out how soil sod and water table change will influence the dis distribution of junkers. Uh, the sodium concentration change is due to tiling sands buried as aquifer layer underground. Therefore, the sodium will be brought into a fin with groundwater. Uh, and water table change is mostly related to climate and topography on the site. Uh, there are three parts in my objectives. Uh, part one is imagery analysis. I'm going to map the distribution of junkers and carrots based on the phenology pattern and plant coverage data from 2015 to 2019 and integrate the result with water table and salinity data. Uh, the part two is greenhouse experiment. I'm going to set up a greenhouse experiment to control the salinity and water table in the growing season of junkers and measure the junkers response, including greenness from RGB images, photosynthesis rate, uh, biomass and sodium, potassium, and nitrogen content in plant tissues. Uh, the part three is a field collection. Uh, I'll measure the CO2 water table, greenness, and biomass in the field to help mapping from satellite images and comparing the greenhouse experiment. Uh, I have completed the distribution map of junkers and carrots in 2015 and set up the greenhouse experiment. Uh, now I'm in Alberta to collect field data. Uh, so in this presentation, I will focus on the part one, part two, and share some field photos in part three. Um, the part one is the imagery analysis. Uh, this, this graph presents the greenest change on the film between 2013 to 2020. As we can see, the greenest have been increasing during the year after it was planted with carrots and junkers in 2013. It also shows the phenology pattern of plants in each year. Uh, green is going up and down in a specific time. Uh, so in next step, I'm going to figure out whether there are differences between junkers and carrots in the phenology pattern. Uh, this map presents the fence seedling layout in 2015. Uh, the, dark, uh, the dark pink area were planted with junkers and the, dark, uh, the light pink area were planted with carrots. Uh, gradually changing color areas were planted with uh, carrots and junkers in different density, or orange for uh, junkers and green for carrots. Uh, in phenology analysis, I calculated the green chromatic coordinate data from sample areas chosen based on this map and fit it into a Gaussian curve where A is the peak value of GCC, B is the critical point, uh, also called day of year at peak GCC, uh, C is the growth rate of the curve. Uh, the supervised classification used the, the sample area as the training data and used the maximum likelihood as the algorithm. Uh, this is the result of GCC feeding into a Gaussian Gaussian curve. Uh, satellite images were taken in 2015 and photo images were taken by Scott and Emily in 2019. The graphs indicate that uh, Carrox has higher GCC than Junkers, especially between 200 and 220 day of year, which is between uh, July and August. Therefore, it is possible it has possibility to separate them on satellite images based on the phenology feature. Uh, the result of the distribution map could approximately map match with the fin layout, 
For example, in zone one, Carrox is surrounded by juncus. Uh, zone two, jun juncus is planted near to the uh, inundated area. And in zone three, the pattern of juncus and Carrox matches the layout map. Um, the table shows the separability among various classes. The range is between zero and two. High separability means that those two classes are easy to be distinguished from the satellite images. Uh, Junkus and Carrox has a poor separability. To improve it, I'll try to add the plant coverage data with coordinates in the classification provided by Professor David Cooper. Uh, furthermore, the time series detection method is another approach uh, I could use to improve the accuracy of the classification by calculating the greenness change between months. Uh, besides, the accuracy might be overestimated because it used the training data for the accuracy assessment, so I need to do a post assessment later. The part two is the greenhouse experiment. I'm going to describe the describe it following this flow chart. Uh, to mimic the impact of uh, water stress and soil soft stress on juncus occurred in the constructed fin, uh, this experiment is going to measure the response of juncus and their various water table and soil salinity levels. Uh, the fully grown plants will be planted in milled peat and exposed to seven sodium concentration solutions and two water tables. The equipment include beans, pots, pit moss, and small pots as stand. And chemicals include sodium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, calcium sulfate, potassium chloride, uh, calcium chloride, and fertilizer matched to the field data. Uh, during the experiment, I'm going to measure the longest leaf length of original plant and ramage. Uh, the photosynthesis rate based on the somato conductance and, and transpiration rate uh, and uh, RGB images for grainers uh, and the water samples for major cations, anions, and nutrients. nutrients. After the experiment, I'm going to measure the root length above ground and below ground biomass, uh, sodium, potassium, and uh, nitrogen concentration in biomass and pore water chemical analysis. Uh, so the expected results might be leaf growth for the synthesis rate and greenness might be inhibited by the high sodium concentration. Root length might be impacted more by the water table level um, and potassium concentration might be less in the root and higher in leaves but the total con content do not change much. So this is uh, part of three, the field collection. Uh, I'm going to measure the CO2 of junkers at different water level in the field and take photos every week in each color to get the greenness data. Uh, I will also collect the biomass before leaving. And here are some wild animals I found in the site like frogs, crane, and black bear, um, which indicates that this site is an ideal habitat for the wild animals. Uh, and thanks my supervisor, Maria helped me a lot to, for the thesis design and let me go to the uh, uh, Alberta. And thanks Scott to help me out of the uh, Gaussian curve uh, and Jonathan provide, provided the salinity data uh, and David Cooper, Cooper uh, gave me the uh, vegetation coverage data. Uh, and thanks, uh, those companies uh, gave the funding for this project. Uh, project. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, John Chi, for your presentation. Lots, lots of work for, ahead of you. Uh, you'll be a busy guy. That's great to see. Um, and I'll open the floor. We have time for a couple questions. So happy for to hear questions from uh, those of you that are attending today.
I'll ask a, I'll ask a quick one. Your the water table depths for your experiment um, five and fifteen. How did you determine how you would set your your endpoints for water table depth? Uh, thanks for pointing it out. Um, the water table is is the I, I took the water table average water table from from the twenty fifteen year um, as the as the water table I used in the greenhouse experiment. Uh, yeah, yeah, because in that year, uh, it's more easy to, to see from the satellite images to see how, how the uh, vegetation grows on there, like from uh, use the like layout map. So, yeah. Okay, good. Other questions? Okay, I don't see any coming in, so I think you're off the hook. Um, so just a few things as we wrap up. Thanks very much, Tian Shi, and perhaps I will um, just say thanks to all of our speakers. We had four really nice talks today. Um, appreciate all of you making the effort to, to submit to this session and, and sharing some of your research with us. So that's great. I also thank my co-conveners, those of you that have uh, joined us today for this session, and also to Uswa uh, for making our job uh, easy as conveners and for keeping a, a well-run uh, well uh, session here today. So I just want to uh, highlight that there's another session on Thursday. The theme of that session, this is from the hydrology section, advances in global water, water connectivity, and water infrastructure data. So hopefully many of you will be able to join this as well. Um, and also a plug for our second biogeosciences section, which is on Tuesday, next Tuesday, the 13th. And this session will focus on ecosystem carbon cycling. So uh, please join us for that if you're able. And um, a reminder, again, that we are meeting uh, for the AGM at three o'clock. So this meeting will close, but use the same link. We'll start up at three and, uh, and hope you can join us for our, our AGM. Finally, uh, as mentioned off the top, we're gonna end this session featuring the promotional video for next year's meeting in Saskatoon. So we hope to see many of you there. And thanks again all for, for joining today and hope to see you in a few moments at the AGM.